Now, uh, the panel's title is Bridging Infrastructure Gap. How does Nigeria measure up and how can we uh, sort of up the metrics so that we deliver uh, the benefits of infrastructure uh, delivery to the country, the benefits to its citizens? I will start, uh, open up this panel with a question to uh, Mr. Oliver Andrew to give your views on infrastructure deficit in Nigeria. The AFC has done work across, uh, across Africa. Uh, where do you think, um, in spite of all the documented uh, situation of the, of the infrastructure gaps, what do you think we're doing wrong? And how can we, and what's happening in other regions where you are active? Thank you very much. I think um, I, I arrived last Wednesday. And I want to give an example of um, what I see as the gap and how uh, um, it appears to you every day. I mean, all of us here, we provide to some way a large degree of our own infrastructure. Um, we either have our own generators, our own boreholes, uh, and do the things that's outside what the public sector provides. But I think what was very stark for me in terms of the infrastructure deficit was when a week last Wednesday I arrived from Accra and uh, came in with uh, Namibia and it was pouring down with rain on Wednesday night and I had just left one of the most beautiful airports I'd ever witnessed because it was my first time in Accra since that airport was open. And I know you've all seen it in the social media but this was stark because, first of all, we waited 30 minutes in the aeroplane when we landed and arrived at the bridge, simply because the bridge could not meet the door for some reason. But when we even got out eventually at about 23.30, 11.30 or so, it was pouring and with rain and leaking through all the bridge. And that for me was very stark. The contrast was very stark about where are we going wrong in infrastructure in Nigeria. But maybe you could say, well, that was the Ajibota's way of experiencing the, sh the shortfall or deficit in infrastructure. I tell you, every day in this country, our fellow Nigerians up and down the country experience it in a greater degree. You just have to travel not even outside our great metropolis of Lagos for you to see the misery caused to our folks by this deficit in infrastructure. Infant mortality, the, the fact that we have unemployment, people are creative yet they are not provided with you like the tools necessary to open their small businesses because you don't have power, which is fundamental. But even then you go further back and you say, well look, I've managed to open industry, you have all the industry along the Lagos Ibadan access. And it was interesting, I met somebody the other day who's, when I said, well, look, said they've suffered from the downturn in the economy, but um, I said, well, why don't you try exporting to neighboring countries? He then pointed out to me that it was cheaper for a Chinese exporter to send a container to Accra from Shanghai than it was for him to export to Accra. Even more expensive for him to take his container from that access to our papa. That tells us something, truly. Too often we measure this deficit in terms of access to electricity. We measure it in terms of what number of roads. I say that access, we live it and breathe it to them and it's causing great misery. The question is, do we truly want to take the measures we have to take to solve it? My thesis to you this morning is that two things will happen. I think technology will be one area in which I think will help us overcome that deficit, particularly in the power sector, where one doesn't have to rely on public patronage. Um, secondly, I think the cost will continue be, to be so high in terms of cost to our economy that I think at some point we will get the level of decision making we need uh, to be able to ensure that um, we create that environment that is necessary for investment to come into the private sector. I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my second question is for MSN Loring, uh, country manager for the IFC. 
could you give your views on what sectors in Nigeria you think are critical for, for growth, for development, for inclusive growth, for sustainable growth in Nigeria, and any sort of subsector nuances that you think you see? Sure, thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I also noted that I think on the first panel, we had maybe one CFA charter member. I am not as well, but I, um, I'm glad to be here and glad to be invited to this, this forum. And um, Oliver kind of stole a little bit of my thunder in his response because I think as a development professional, it's really important to kind of put infrastructure in the broader context. Um, so I'll speak specifically to sectors, but there, it's actually quite related. Um, about a month ago, maybe three weeks ago, the World Bank Group um, released its Human Capital Index. Now, this is the first time we've done something like this, and basically what it does is it measures a country's ability to be able to, to, to have their citizens be productive, be healthy, productive, and to actually contribute to the growth of the economy. Nigeria is 152 out of 157 countries globally. Now, that should concern all of us because if we're having a conversation about roads and rail and power and we're not having a conversation about health and education and investing in children so that they can take advantage of that infrastructure, we're, we're gonna miss um, a significant opportunity to actually put Nigeria on a, on a positive growth path. Um, I also think it's important for us to keep in mind that for the 10 years or so that Nigeria had uh, GDP growth of about 6%, above 6%, um, during that period of time, we also had increasing poverty. So again, context, incredibly, incredibly important. I think if we don't think about these things, if we, if we continue to look at Nigeria from the lens of Lagos, we're also missing mm -hmm a big opportunity here because Legos can be an engine of growth for the country, but only if we understand the, the context of the greater country. Um, so these are, these are issues that as a development professional we take very seriously, we see it, um, and, and, and I'm hoping that in a, in a conversation like this where we are talking about the potential of the country going forward, we're talking about the entire country and not specific country. The only way we're gonna be able to capitalize on Nigeria's potential is if we're having a broader viewpoint. So from my perspective, health and education are critical sectors when we're thinking about um, Nigeria going forward. If we're not investing in health and education today actively, Nigeria invests maybe about, I think less than 1% of GDP in health, uh, which is far less than many of its peer countries. So I want us to keep that in mind as well. It's not to, I know the last panel ended on a very positive note. I am very, a very optimistic person. And I put, these, I put this before you because I think that we can change the direction, but only if we're keeping it in mind. Linked to that is the spatial inequality that we have. And again, this, the infrastructure piece falls squarely into that, which is North and South Nigeria. On every single human development indicator, the differences are stark. We have to be able to have a a consensus view around the country's development and not have it be focused on certain areas. So we need to keep these things in mind in order for Nigeria to really get to a place where um, I heard some very optimistic views on GDP per capita. That only matters if it's spread more equitably. If it's concentrated in certain parts of the country, then it doesn't matter as much in terms of the country's development. But I want to uh, focus a little bit on um, something that was uh, focused on in the last panel around this question of trust and why it focuses, it links very clearly into the infrastructure question and what Nigeria needs to do to capitalize and to, to, to address this infrastructure deficit. Um, at the end of the day, again, we can bandy about a lot of figures around what the deficit is. It's a huge deficit, whether it be power, roads, rail, you name it, there's an incredible need for additional infrastructure develop, uh, investment in Nigeria. And when there's a need, investors like IFC and other investors want to actually put their money to work. So Nigeria for us remains a very important country when we think about the, the infrastructure potential and we want to direct capital there. But in order to make that happen, this question of trust actually becomes very, very important because ultimately, as much as we would like to take government out of the picture, they are very much in the picture for certain things. And so when we start to see more, um, how would I say, more trust between the private sector and government around executing projects, I think then we will see much more investment come into the infrastructure space. 
So you sign an agreement, you sign a contract, you deliver on it. You don't two or three years later decide, oh, we don't like it anymore, so we're just going to pay you off. As an investor, the signaling is very poor. So we want to see more and more of that commitment to long-term investment. Infrastructure investment is by nature long-term. It's not three or five years. It's, it has a much longer time horizon. And the only way to do that effectively is if an investor has confidence in the policy environment. So we've seen a lot of improvement in that, in that direction. So it's, the, the trend is positive, certainly. Um, but I think we could go even further in, in terms of really developing that trust. And then I think um, to the point that was made uh, also around what are the, goal, the role of government versus private sector, I very much agree. I think as we look forward, um, we need to be able to have conversations about infrastructure and infrastructure development that don't rely on what government does or doesn't do. So I agree 100%. And I do also agree that power is an area where we're seeing a lot of innovation, a lot of small investments actually translating into very high levels of impact. It's not a perfect solution, but it's a solution that's going to, I think, move us in the right direction. So ultimately, when you see that innovation happening, when you see people having trust in the system, I think you're going to see a lot more capital coming into the infrastructure sector. But again, until we start to focus on the other side of that, which is health and education, then I think that that picture comes together nicely. It may not be four to five years, but certainly I could see um, eight to ten years being very optimistic. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Emma. And thanks for highlighting um, the need for both uh, social and hard infrastructure. When we think about infrastructure and the deficit, we normally just go to uh, the road and rails, and thanks for highlighting that. Now, whether it's soft or hard, we need financing uh, yeah. for this. And um, we need to create functional systems, which is a project pipeline and mm -hmm. a pipeline of funding mm -hmm. for projects in, 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 in Nigeria. How do you create an enabling em environment for for, uh, for funding uh, mm -hmm. these sort of projects uh, okay. in the local markets? So, so perhaps I could um, start with the last you know, point that I think Eme made so beautifully around the impact of trust and consistency. Um, consistency in government regulation is absolutely ex you know, essential. And I'd like to start by sort of you know, getting you all to recall the launch of mobile telephony in this country. I sat in an auction room in January of 2001, and I won one of you know, three licenses that was issued at that time. We had a regulator in the industry um, who started off um, wanting to place curbs on tariffing. I led the industry conversation with the regulator at the time essentially to get the regulator to understand that when you only had 460,000 lines in a country, it didn't matter what the tariff was. Competition ultimately would be the long-term regulator of the market. And what was more important was to allow all of the operators that had won licenses make investments in a long-term sustainable manner, have an opportunity to get a return, and ultimately there would be sufficient capacity. It took less than two years for that story to come to pass. The very first thing that happened was within a month and a half of our launching networks, we dropped connection prices from 36,000 Naira to 1,000 Naira. Within another six months, seeing the slow pace at which we were connecting subscribers, again, dropped connections to 100 Naira. Connections to mobile networks today are completely free. Then a fourth network operator got licensed just over two and a half years later. And Glow introduced something called per second billing. And all of us had to develop a welcome plan for the new you know, entrant into the sector. The end result of that was 50 Naira per minute, which was a tariff that we started off, tailed off very, very quickly. And what you found is an industry that has succeeded in attracting consistently over two to two and a half billion dollars 
of capital expenditure every year since January of 2001. And that's the reason why you have today 162 million mobile connections in this country. So consistent regulation, I think, is absolutely important. The second message for me is the importance of local currency financing. All of the most developed economies globally that finance econ um, infrastructure and the 24 economies that are larger than Nigeria, including some of the economies like South Africa, smaller than Nigeria, all finance their infrastructure predominantly in their local currency. Why is this important? If you fail to do so, infrastructure becomes unaffordable, first and foremost, and you cannot add rapidly to the infrastructure stock of that country. So financing in local currency, developing large, liquid, diversified pools of capital within the economy that have the ability to invest in infrastructure is mission critical. Domestic capital markets will also come to play a very, very important role. And if you look globally, um, and you know, one of them is, you know, bosses at the IFC always tells this story extremely well. Jing Donghua, um, the IFC's treasurer, who's just about to become World Bank treasurer. There is no global economy that has succeeded successfully in financing infrastructure that hasn't developed large, diversified, very liquid domestic capital markets. And the capital markets come to play a critical role, whether through infrastructure bonds, or it's through other types of project bonds, or it's through infrastructure funds. The capital markets have an opportunity to play a critical role in that capital formation process for infrastructure. I'd also like to talk about the importance of private sector participation. And why is that important? Today, Nigeria's budget, its largest ever budget, is roughly 5.8% of our GDP. If you think about the domestic pensions, which is the largest domestic pool of capital, about 80% of those domestic pensions, maybe a bit more, are primarily financing 5.8% of the economy. Who is getting capital to the other 94%? And for all of us, it's important to recognize that the government's wallet is completely inadequate. And even worse, the government doesn't spend that wallet properly. So 65 to 67% of its annual budget is spent on recurrent expenditure, primarily salaries, and on debt service. Less than 35% of the government's wallet is actually spent on capital expenditure. And a large portion of that is you know, past dues to contractors, so it's not new productive infrastructure. So what the government must do is to recognize that its limited wallet, along with the government's guarantee, along with the DFI's wallet, must be used essentially to crowd in significant domestic and international pools of capital into infrastructure. Then it's important to sort of prioritize and create a handful of what I might describe as pathfinder projects. So I think there are four key essential areas that we have to focus on investing in. We have to invest in power. We have to invest in energy infrastructure. We have to focus investment um, in transportation infrastructure. And we have to invest in broadband. I like to describe broadband as the infrastructure of the youth or the infrastructure of the future. And if you target infrastructure investing into these four key areas, what you end up creating is something I describe as a sustainable circle of prosperity. You invest in these areas, what you end up doing is you catalyze investments going into agriculture, into mining, into manufacturing, into SMEs, into retail, into healthcare, 
into education, even into security. And what all of those investments end up doing is they create jobs. And what those jobs end up doing is they increase savings, they increase pensions, they increase financial as well as digital inclusion. Then ultimately, they increase demand for housing. And that ultimately is what in the long term will create a prosperous, sustainable economy in this country. Thank you. Very. Thank you for that very, very comprehensive uh, answer. It seems like um, the government has to find a way to trust the private sector to do its part, uh, given that it has a limited budget. I think it's a, it's a two-way process. The government needs to recognize its limitations. The government needs to focus on those things which it does very well. Um, but the government also needs to recognize that there's tremendous capacity, not just financial capacity, but also development capacity as well as um, you know, um, institutional capacity in private sector that must be brought into the equation you know, to get us moving in an area which is mission critical to our long-term sustainability as a nation. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, not the least, uh, Jobalo, in your experience, um, what are your views on, uh, and what has been your experience on uh, investing in infrastructure, and in Nigeria particularly, your experience with sanctity of contracts, challenges with the rule of law, um, especially as it concerns uh, how we need to crowd in private sector investments in infrastructure, especially through public-private partnerships. What are your views on that? What are some of the challenges you've seen? Thank you, Yemi. Uh, I think, apart from the difficulty of being the last speaker in that uh, the previous speakers have said a lot there is to say on the, uh, on the subject, part of the advantage is that you can simply piggyback on what uh, most of them have said and and just try to provide a bit more color uh, to what they have said. And I think the question you've asked me sort of uh, helps uh, in doing that. Um, now, in terms of how you can, uh, talking about how infrastructure investment can be improved, especially how you can give investors more comfort. And uh, in terms of our experience, uh, to put things in context, I, I work for uh, the fund managers of the ARM Harriet Infrastructure Fund. I'm the legal director. I'm also investment director uh, from, from a legal perspective, um, also looking at compliance. And we do have quite considerable experience in infrastructure. Uh, and I would give uh, some of the examples, and I think those examples will help to provide color uh, to some of the discussions we have been having. Um, ARM Harriet Infrastructure Fund is a joint venture business that is uh, formed between the ARM of Nigeria, Asset and Resource Management Company, and Harith General Partners. Harith of South Africa uh, only do infrastructure funds. They are fund managers of infrastructure uh, funds. They have two funds, one that is fully invested and uh, another one uh, that is still in its investment uh, period. And uh, the joint venture with ARM was formed in 2014, and the fund that we have now reached uh, its first close in January of 2015. Now, prior to that joint venture, ARM has been, uh, a, has, uh, um, I think as far back as 2002, started to gradually broaden its investment banking business to include real estate and infrastructure. And uh, the first major foray into infrastructure is, um, was taking advantage of the legal state government's interest in uh, attracting private sector investment into infrastructure as far back as 2002 when the Lagos State government was uh, looking for international investors and local investors, and ARM decided to throw its heart uh, into the ring and um, carried out various studies and also funded some of the um, <clears throat> research and development that was done, which I, I happen to have been privileged to be involved in, that led, uh, on the one hand, to signing an MOU with the government, and also, uh, on the other hand, in putting in place uh, robust legislation that was needed to, be, to underpin uh, private sector participation in infrastructure, which is, is needed. Um, I don't think I need repeat the fact that uh, um, around the world, the declining capacity of government balance sheet in taking care of infrastructure needs 
is, is a reality, both in the developed world and in the developing world as well. Um, so this is something that Lagos government recognized a long time ago, and um, the negotiations between ARM and Lagos State at the time led to the signing of a concession, which is what gave birth to the Lekki Toll Road concession. Now, the Lekki Toll Road concession was pursuant to uh, a concession that was signed in 2006 and that we, we raised financing for in 2008. 2008, uh, the, the project reached financial close, the total financing raised was $427 million for that project. Now, to, um, and this ties back to uh, an important point that Bolaji made. In that project, we were able to secure most of the funding in Naira. We, um, there was a consortium of uh, Nigerian banks, about five or six of them. I say five or six because the sixth one uh, was a, a local uh, subsidiary of an international bank. And then there were two international banks who also lent. And interestingly, one of the, um, and, and by the way, both, both uh, of the uh, in international tranches were 15-year loans, um, which was first of its kind at the time. And um, one of them was purely in Naira, was a pure Naira, Naira debt. And the other one that was even dollars, we were able to put in place a 15-year cross-currency swap that ensured that we were able to match the uh, assets of the, of the project with the, with the liabilities in the sense that, of course, the tolls uh, are, are being collected in Naira. And uh, you would, of course, have to deal with the, the uh, challenges of uh, your dollar obligations. And, of course, the, the, we were able to get the Nigerian banks over the line in providing 12-year 12 12 year, uh, debt, which was first of its kind in the market at the time, they were mostly given five-year loans, and um, they were also, uh, I think that was MTN, that was a finance for MTN that was seven years at the time, so it was first of its kind at the time. So that, that, I just thought I should give that example to show that it has, in, in terms of how you, you can uh, catalyze PPPs and attract, it has been done and it can be done. Now, uh, another project that we have done under the fund, the, the ARM Harriet Infrastructure Fund, which, uh, 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 as I mentioned earlier, reached first close in January 2015, was the Azura Edo IPP. Now, on the Azura Edo IPP, that's an independent power project. It's a 459, 459 megawatts uh, uh, power project that um, is now in commercial operations, by the way. It uh, reached financial close December of uh, 2015. Construction started on the 2nd of January uh, 2016. And um, uh, it, it, came on, uh, it came through with commercial, full commercial operations 24th of May this year, seven months ahead of schedule. Now, I, I emphasize that because part of the discipline that private sector can bring to projects is, is, is the discipline of doing things the way they should be done, and also the discipline of being able to do things within budget. Um, now, private private partnerships is a broad spec is, is a broad spectrum that could range anything from, <clears throat> excuse me, simple O and M as an operations and maintenance contract to full blown privatization, and somewhere in between there you have concessions. All of these in, uh, entail obligations on both sides. That is both on the government side and the private and side and the private side, and the obligations need to be fulfilled. One important uh, characteristic of, of uh, public private partnerships or if you might say project finance is risk allocation. So talking about trust, you have obligations on both sides. The government needs to be able to trust the private sector to fulfill the end of the bargain. And the private sector, even in a privatization scenario, in a full-blown privatization, you will still have government needing to play a facilitator, a facilitator role in regulation and in other ways, legislation and what have you. You still need regulation to be fair, to be transparent, to be apolitical. You still need independent, uh, an independent regulator a regulator that is comprised of persons that are capacitated, that are resourced, that are empowered, and that uh, administer regulation in a fair and transparent manner. So, um, so I'm, I, I've, I've, I've mentioned the Azura. Now, it, it, one important thing I should also mention on the Az, uh, Azura Edo IPP is that, that pro the financing of that project, on, that, on the financing of that project, we had a roll call of virtually all of the major European DFIs. We had a total of 15 international financial institutions, including the IFC, um, multilaterals like the IFC and, and others, who were, if, if, if you would allow me to say, they were literally falling over themselves to provide financing for that project. So the, quest, the question is, what did we do right? 
And what are we failing to do to con uh, in the journey to, con to keep catalyzing a steady stream of uh, infrastructure deals that the private sector can invest in and can, and can attract their, they can inspire confidence in them to enable them invest. Now, you compare that project where you had 15 international banks, and by the way, you had uh, a, local, a local tranche of the loan as well, which was uh, arranged by uh, FCMB, um, um, pursuant to the Power and Aviation Inter Intervention Fund, which was in Naira, and that did help to manage some of the uh, currency risks as well, in addition to the FX hedge that we had to put in place. Now, compare that to the uh, first wave of the power sector privatization, which had no single international player investing in. So that already should have raised the red flag. Now, Nigeria is not a country that can be lightly ignored at all. Nigeria, we have the population, we have the potentials, we have all that it takes. In West Africa, for example, and I, I say West Africa because to put that in context, our fund, the ARM Higher Infrastructure Fund, has a geographical focus for West Africa. In West Africa, Nigeria's population is approximately 50% of the population of the entire West Africa. In West Africa, Nigeria's GDP is approximately 70% of GDP of the entire West Africa. So when Nigeria sneezes, the entire West Africa catches a cold. So you cannot want to come to do business in West Africa and ignore Nigeria. So Nigeria is a market that is seriously watched by international investors. There's a lot of interest, but unfortunately it's a wait and see. We, in our fund, for example, we, we are, we, we are, we, we, one of the things that we were proud about, we, we have a very healthy and uh, robust pipeline of deals. But we found out that in the last few years, several, so many deals in the pipeline, so many infrastructure projects in the pipeline, some of them Nigeria, and some of them the other West African countries. Now that is uh, important because we are compelled both by regulation and practical reasons to focus more on Nigeria because we are registered, we are registered for in Nigeria and the regulations of the Securities and Exchange Commission and uh, an indirect regulator, which is uh, uh, the National Pension Commission, because we have, and that is because we have pension funds that invested in our fund. They made their uh, pension funds invested in infrastructure for the first time uh, in our fund in 2015 uh, in Nigeria. Um, so we are compelled to invest a minimum of 60% of our fund in Nigeria. Now we have by far more projects in our deal pipeline for Nigeria than the rest of West Africa. But you know what has happened over, over time? I was just having a conversation with Andrew Ali, uh, the former uh, CEO of the AFC, and I was saying that over the last few years, virtually all of our Nigerian deals have just gradually gotten cold on us, and we have more warm deals. So now, we use warm deals and, and cold deals as terminology that we use to distinguish between warm deals being deals that are making steady progress, and are at advanced stages of negotiation and development in the progress of financial close, and the cold ones being deals that not much is happening and is moving extremely slowly, and we, cannot, we do not have a clear line of sight financial close. We are gradually seeing that a lot of our Nigerian projects have just been getting colder and colder, and we've been looking more outside Nigeria. We invested in a power plant in, West, in uh, Ghana. It's a 200 megawatt power plant, about half the size of Azura, even though it's a uh, it's better technology. It's, cl it's a closed cycle power plant. It's almost like a renewable power plant in terms of uh, emissions. So, Bala, could you and we, bring okay, it yeah, I'll, I'll round up now. So, and we're also um, about to do another deal yet in Ghana. Now, the question is, what are we not doing right? What are we not getting right in Nigeria? And some, these are some of the things that both uh, Eme and Bolaji have, uh, have, have, uh, have talked about, as well as uh, Oliver of the AFC. Now, we need to, ins we need to do a better job of inspiring investor confidence. The reality is that, that we need to understand in Nigeria is that Nigeria is just part of a global ecosystem of investment opportunities. Investors have a choice to go elsewhere. They do not have to come to Nigeria. In, when Nigeria is in competition, you see, infrastructure investing for the private sector is international business. The kinds of capital, now it will take time. Uh, Bolaji rightly mentioned the fact that we need to be able to eventually do more of financing projects using funding from Nigeria. And the Nigerian pension funds, for example, are an important uh, a, a stakeholder community that should eventually get more and more comfortable. And of course, the government should, should do more to get them more comfortable to provide uh, the sort of protections that they need to be able to invest in infrastructure. So we need to do better inspiring confidence. We need to improve clarity and consistency 
or in policy because clarity and consistency translates to predictability. Predictability is almost synonymous to perception of low risk. Investors can invest more. You need to provide incentives. Don't be afraid of providing guarantees. It's not every single project eventually will get guarantees, but you need to use these incentives to eventually catalyze a steady stream of projects that will give investors the confidence to know that, okay, there is a track record of delivering infrastructure deals. Now, in an uncanny way, um, you need to also, now, that if PPPs is just, it's just this, a second route to delivering infrastructure. The, the, there is a traditional procurement route. Now, the, the contractors that work for you, early this year, when the, the Minister for Works was briefing the, House of, the Federal House of Representatives, he um, mentioned that about 2.7 trillion naira was being owed to contractors uh, who have been building federal roads over the years. And this is not only the current administration. Now, when investors are looking to invest in Nigeria, that sort of information is, you know, is a red flag for them. It means they will ask for more and more guarantees. So these are the things. So you even need to take better, pay better attention to your local country, your, your own directly procured contractors, so that the private sector investors can get more confidence. So these are the things Absolutely. that, so in general, I, 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 would, I would basically um, summarize by saying that we, the government and the entire country needs to under, uh, try to understand investor behavior and the factors that drive uh, uh, in, you know, investment in infrastructure okay. better so that we can do a better job of inspiring confidence. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jobalo. We'll have a, a lightning round. Uh, we have a little, uh, just a little bit of time left. What would you say, Oliver, would be two, three things you think we can emulate uh, from other African countries who are doing well in infrastructure delivery? Just two or three things on your mind. The sanctity of contracts, I think, would be top of my agenda. Um, meaning that when you enter into a concession, um, the terms and obligation on both sides and on all sides are honored to the very end. That, I think, is, um, would be top. The holy grail in terms for, in, for, for, for actually, if you look at the financing aspect of it, must be actually the way we try to, to, to get local capital markets involved, um, trying to find ways in which we actually make investments in infrastructure in local currency. I think um, there are some ideas coming through, and we hope within the next... Uh, within the next 12 months anyway, there will be the appropriate type of local funding um, that, w that can be available um, so that um, in, a, in, the, in the quantum that we need um, for, for the, 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 the opportunities that we see in Nigeria. But I come back to my original point. We know there's the deficit. We know that um, we see this wall of liquidity, be it um, uh, outside or within Nigeria. The fact of the matter is, unless we create that environment, unless we actually begin to have an honest conversation amongst ourselves, and the omens are not good when you look at what's happened in the power sector. Whatever you may want to say, there were investors that went in there with hundreds of millions of dollars. And today, we know that they've got past due obligations in nearly all of those, uh, they're not making the returns they envisage because the conditions under which they made their investments have changed. And I think we need to address that. That's the centrality of the question here. Um, the, the issue of, of local funding, I mean, Tijan Chamd, I think, summed it well when he made a speech last year saying, making infrastructure investments in Africa in foreign exchange is just stupid. I mean, it's just silly. So we all are working towards that. You will find that AFC, together with colleagues in other DFIs, are, are going to try and address that fact very soon. Um, and, and, and we hope to do that. I must say, in all of this, though, um, I mean, we can paint a dark picture, and it shouldn't be all dark, because there is something happening here in our metropolis. I, I actually say it's the, it's the eighth wonder of the world happening right here in Lagos. Please go and see, if you have some time, go up the Lake Ekpiju access, and you see what's happening there in terms of infrastructure development. For any potential financier, budding infrastructure developer, um, engineer, investor, whatever, take 
a Saturday afternoon or Sunday afternoon and drive up to that access. And then you see what is happening with respect to the new port that's being built in Lakey, with respect to the, 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 the refinery that the Dangote Group is putting up on the fertilizer plant. And you just see the development of that access. Now, that gives me hope. It gives me hope because I say to you all that there's going to come a time soon when really we will do these kind of projects and the role of government will be minimized. And that gives me hope because that, if that happens, what, why, and why do I say that? I mean, if I look at the subcontracting opportunities that must be coming out of there, be it if I was a, 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 a plumber, a welder, a company that supplies security, um, the banks along that area, it shows to me that I am not waiting. I, despite the fact that we all say infrastructure investments, government has a key role to play in terms of being the regulator in most of these sectors. There are sectors that are outside that maybe that's where we as investors should be actually focusing on and saying, can we find investment opportunities where with the appropriate type of financing and minimal public sector intervention, we can get it going. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver. Um, I'll just address some of the questions from the floor uh, to uh, uh, the appropriate panelists. And there's a question here for, uh, I think, Emme. We all agree that uh, we gradually have to move away from total reliance on government for socioeconomic development. What would you suggest we do as a private sector in relation to building social infrastructure, such as education, health, and for children? Um, thanks for the question. It's definitely a tough one. I would say, um, so first of all, we're very bullish on, on healthcare in Nigeria. Um, what the recession taught us was that um, the healthcare sector can be, at least certain parts of it, can be quite resilient to macroeconomic headwinds. And so what you, ha what you I think we all experienced was that if people who would normally go abroad to, to get medical treatment didn't have access to dollars, so they stayed home. And so what, that, what happened was is that you had investors in the sector starting to look at now putting a lot of capital into healthcare in Nigeria. So I think that's a, that's a sector we're very bullish about. It also has implications for Nigerians across the country. Um, so I would certainly be looking at that, that sector. And again, infrastructure ties in to all of these things very, very, um, it, they're, they're, they're connected in ways that are, you can't, you, you have to focus on the infrastructure question in order to have a conversation about whether or not healthcare can take off. So healthcare, I would say, is important there. Um, and, a, and a sector that uh, we think is going to do relatively well. Um, in education, it's a little bit tougher as well because obviously this is a social space, public good space, and so the areas for the, pri the private sector to get involved are, are, are few and far between, but they do exist. And so where we've been very excited, particularly um, in Africa, also Nigeria, Kenya, and other countries like that, are where you see opportunities to really drive technology solutions into what will be traditional education. And so there, I think we're, we're very excited. The, the ability for the education sector in Nigeria to leapfrog using technology as a base, I think, is, is incredible. And you do need to have government embracing these technologies, but more and more at the state level, we're seeing governments who are absolutely concerned about the poor educational outcomes and are willing to embrace these uh, solutions going forward. So it's a difficult space, but I think um, when you add technology in the mix, it becomes very exciting. And I just want to take the opportunity to just build off of what um, Oliver said in terms of sanctity of contracts as well. Incredibly, incredibly important. If you walk away from this panel with no other um, message or takeaway, keep that in mind. It is critically important for all the entities that are involved. Infrastructure projects are very challenging to structure. You have all manner of stakeholders and you need, need to figure out how to mitigate risks in every single area. It's critically important to have every single stakeholder playing its role. Sanctity of contracts, contract enforcement, all of these things are critically important. So if you walk away with no other takeaway, keep that in mind. We don't care who's in government. It is irrelevant. It should be completely irrelevant who is sitting in Abuja. What matters is that they've taken those contracts and then they've lived up to the obligations of previous administrations and then they pass it on to the next one. So that's very, very important concept. I hope we walk away understanding how important that is. Thanks. Thank you, Emma. And I'll just address the last one, or second to last. Two questions actually to uh, Bolaji. Um, and the first one is about how, 
How can we deepen the global, the capital markets to trust that they will recover their investments when it's channeled into development of the infrastructure deficiency? And related to that, um, where it says financial institutions want short-term returns on investments, return on infrastructure projects are long-term. How do you sort of align this? Okay. Um, I think first and foremost, the way that you um, deepen capital markets participation around infrastructure investing um, is to ensure that the first pathfinder deals that we do set a very, very high bar. And I'll give you one example. Um, so I don't just talk, um, I try to do things. So um, just under three years ago, I decided to go and create something called the Nigeria Infrastructure Debt Fund. And the whole idea was to create a vehicle which was channeling capital primarily from Nigeria's pension industry safely and sustainably um, into infrastructure. We recognize that the infrastructure asset class is quite a wide one, and probably the safest, most predictable place to start was on the infrastructure credit side. So what do we do? We've created effectively a listed infrastructure REIT. It's not an idea that's original to Nigeria. There are many of these things that trade in London and trade in other markets. And what we do basically is we registered a program with the SEC, which is a roughly $550 million program. We issue regularly, but a lot of the time. We created a very strong governance structure around um, the fund. So what we've done is looked at the governance requirements of both the pension regulator and the SEC, and we've lifted the bar beyond that. And we've done it for one specific reason. We've done it so that if anyone else, and Nigerians are very good at copying things, enters the segment and wants to copy us, um, they will have to lift the bar very, very high to be comparable. We raise money three, four times a year from pension fund managers. Today, we've been able to attract 18 of Nigeria's pension funds. The Sovereign Wealth Fund has invested. Nigeria's Sovereign Wealth Fund has not been mandated to invest in Naira, but this is the first exception that they have made and invested in local currency with us. Um, some two, three weeks ago, um, another DFI, the African Development Bank, announced the approval of an investment in the fund. And I'm with my begging bowl outside Oliver's door and Ames, <laughs> Ames door hoping that they will join, you know, um, you know this, interesting and compelling story soon. We finance, we provide 10 to 15 year local currency financing to infrastructure projects. We're the only source of 10 to 15 year Naira in Nigeria today. The banks may have done that when they did LCC, but all those banks have disappeared. And the average tenor of bank loans today in Nigeria is two years and three months. Every quarter, as we receive the interest, we distribute it to our investors. Our returns, pretty robust, um, somewhere around 400, 450 basis points north of the 10-year government bond. Um, investing safely, sustainably in domestic infrastructure. We've invested in hard infrastructure, but we're also now investing in social infrastructure projects. And it may highlighted the incredible opportunity that exists in healthcare. Um, but there's an even more interesting opportunity around education, which is not only tied to technology, um, but is available around what we call energizing education, which is providing power to university campuses and schools across Nigeria. But also more importantly, there are tremendous opportunities around student housing, which is a tremendous area. And what you do essentially is to address a significant element of the educational challenge in Nigeria, and hopefully that frees up capacity for the universities to go and spend their money on other things. Thank you very much. Our time is up. Um, we've heard sanctity of contract, solid legal frameworks, 
local currency funding, capital markets, uh, development so we can access longer tenure. Uh, thank you my, for my panelists for such a wonderful discussion. Thank you. Could you give them a hand?